Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started for today. Um, welcome to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Congenital Heart Surgery Database monthly webinar. Today is Tuesday, uh, June the 20th of 2023. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut down uh, the um, chat box. So remember, just please remember if you have any questions moving forward or any comments, please be sure to uh, put those into the Q and A. Um, on the call with me today from the um, from the STS side, we have myself, uh, Carol Crom, Chastity um, Bonnets, and Leslie Wacker, our two CHSC consultants, and we also have our ACSD consultant on as well, Melinda. So it's a small group um, on our side today. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I do not have um, any new information from our last call, June 6th, from our user group call. So I do not have any additional updates. Um, if you were not able to join our last call, please go out to the STS website. Um, there is a link to the slides as well as a link to um, the recording from our last call. I did provide um, AQO updates. Um, uh, training manual update. So the training manual has been posted and that is out on the STS website as well. So please check out our um, June 6 call for any updates um, that you may have missed or that if you were not on um, last on our last call. So that is out on the STS website. So um, like I said, um, Chastity and Leslie are going to hop into our 6.23.2 data, data manager education. Um, they have a lot of information to cover today. So I am going to go ahead and turn things over to Chastity and Leslie and let's uh, kick off our um, next section for the 6.23.2 um, education. So Chastity, Leslie, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. And if you don't mind, Leanne, I'll have you advance the slides when I say next slide. <laughs> Sounds perfect. Just say all right, word. perfect. Next slide. Welcome back, everybody. This is our second in the series of um, data manager education for the version of 6.23.2, still set to go live on July 1st. Um, and today, we, Leslie and I are going to focus on what's now called the post-operative event section. So you'll notice in the data collection form that it no longer says complications or post-op complications, but it has been renamed post-operative events. And I think that this name better, um, I, I guess, qualifies or describes this section because we're really looking to describe the patient's post-operative, intraoperative and post-operative course. And it it's not necessarily complication or ascribing blame or um, saying that somebody did something wrong. We're simply saying this event occurred in the post-operative or intraoperative setting, and we do want to collect it, capture it. Sometimes it explains why someone might have an increased length of stay post-operatively. So we're, we're really working to capture the post-operative intraoperative course of a patient that undergoes congenital heart surgery. So there are some, um, as you've seen throughout 6.23.2, there are major changes coming to this section of the database. So even if you have been doing this database for a very, very long time and you're very familiar with things, many of the definitions for especially the major post-operative events have changed. So it, you will always need to have the training manual open as you are collecting the post-operative events to make sure you're cap capturing them correctly. So we are gonna focus today largely on those major post-operative events. And um, we're gonna look at renal failure, interventional casts, neurological deficit, reoperations, both cardiac and non-cardiac tracheostomy, because it's going to have its own special um, definitions as well as diaphragm paresis. So Leslie and I have split up these topics so you don't get tired of hearing um, one of us and then we'll let's save all questions to the end. Um, so then that way we can, we can tackle them as we go. Next slide, Leanne. All right, so just a few um, notes on the post-operative event section. Not all of this is new, um, but I just wanna point it out because I think they are important points. So post-operative event from the get-go is already a misnomer because as you know, the congenital database, unlike the other STS databases, does include um, data collection of intraoperative events. These are delineated in the definition, so there won't be any surprises. There are no new intraoperative events that will be collected. So it really focuses around um, cardiac arrest and then the arrhythmia complications or events. 
Um, also, new information, as I've already said, we have new definitions for old and existing events um, in the database. So make sure you will um, be referring to the, the training manual once it does get posted. There are also new event fields. The, there are new event fields for both adult only patients, as well as new event fields for all patients. So you wanna be paying attention to that. Events will still overlap. We know this, we've lived with this in the congenital database. It's important for the different ways when we um, do the analysis as to how they can pull out um, the specific postoperative events. So still anticipate that there will be many events that overlap with one another. Remember there is not one compilation of all of the postoperative events. There's no adding it up and saying, well, you had four postoperative events and another program had three, therefore your program is better or anything like that. We're really capturing the postoperative course of these patients. All events will be collected through the surgical hospital discharge date or through post-op day 30, whichever is longer. So if a patient were to go home before post-operative day 30, you are, you're still following them out through post-op day 30, whichever is longer. So this is all events, but then there's gonna be a breakdown for um, some different data collection if they are the major post-op events. And again, there will be some events that are specific to the patient age. So whether you're older than 18 or less than 18 at the time of surgery. So you may be collecting some additional fields for the adult patients and or additional fields for the less than 18 year old patients. Next slide. So as I spoke to you um, on the previous slide, we talked about the time frame. So while all events will be collected through um, surgical hospital discharge or through the 30th postoperative day, if your surgical hospital discharge were to end before the 30th postoperative day, the remaining time frame for the events is really going to be based on the designation of the event. So intraoperative, if it's an intraoperative event, you're only going to collect it during the procedure or while the patient is, is in the OR, if that's where the procedure occurs versus major and other post-operative events. So Leanne, if you advance the slide, we can look at the more specific definitions for this. So as I said, intraoperative events are gonna be collected while the patient is undergoing the procedure or that they're in the OR, should it be happening in the OR. Major post-operative events will now be collected through the end of the episode of care. So this means if you transfer to long-term care or to another acute care hospital, you are collecting all major post-operative events through the end of the episode of care. The other post-operative events, I probably in my mind like to call these minor or not major post-operative events. Um, these are collected through the surgical hospital discharge date um, or through the 30th post-operative day, should you um, discharge prior to the 30th, 30th post-operative day. So in the training manual, you're gonna see every um, event listed will say, what is the time frame? It may say intraoperative and major, intraoperative and other, or just major or just other. And so these are very clearly delineated. Next slide. So I also created this um, little algorithm schema um, that might make this a little bit more clear rather for those of you who don't wanna read a bunch of text um, that you're able to refer to this. And this will also be included in the, the training manual, but surgery date is post-op day zero. Um, all events are then collected through the hospital discharge date. And then depending on where you discharge to and the timing of your discharge, then um, it also gives you a little bit more information as to how to collect the post-operative events. Next slide. So let's look at a few specific events and so you can get a better understanding of what the training manual is going to look like. So acute renal failure. As you know, the definition for acute renal failure in the congenital database as you may or may not know, varies um, tremendously from that of the adult database. And really this is based on what constitutes renal failure in a child versus, or baby versus an adult. So we had to make way and um, to bring in the adult definition, but still attempt to capture the same information. So renal failure will now be defined as at least one of the following, a new requirement for dialysis, and then if you're less than 18 years of age, we have the same definition that the congenital database has been working with, um, urine output less than 0.5 mils per kg per hour for 24 hours and or a rise in your serum creatinine. And then we brought over the adult definition as well. So if you're older than 18 years of age, you have a serum creatinine level um, to look at there. 
what is hugely different in this definition compared to the 3.4 definition, 3.41, um, dialysis is no longer a requirement to select the field acute renal failure. Um, so just so you know, no longer is that required. We are now going to be able to say that the patient did or didn't receive dialysis in a child field once you select acute renal failure. So if you're following along on your data collection form, you see acute renal failure is now just a standalone field in the post-operative event list. From there, you will collect um, the child fields and that'll be um, coming up, we'll discuss those. So know that again, acute renal failure, this is not a change. It is a major post-operative event. And so we are going to collect it through the major post-operative event timeframe. And now of course, we'll talk about the child fields that we can select for dialysis therapy if there was any. Next slide. So once you select, was there acute renal failure? Now we go on to the child field and we can select the type of dialysis that the patient received. And in the training manual, there will be a definition for each of these and when you should select this. So the only new field for the congenital database is actually the no hemofiltration or dialysis required. Um, I do want to point out that in the training manual, it says hospital discharge, and you see all of these say discharge. This is not going to be the case because we are collecting this through the end of the episode of care. So as you know, this means major event time frame, and this is all delineated then in the training manual as a clarification that you are collecting these until the end of the episode of care. So while your data collection form says hospital discharge, it's, it's an error, and this will be that we're collecting it through the end of the episode of care. Now we have a new caveat that if the patient meets the definition for acute renal failure as delineated on the previous slide, but no dialysis or hemofiltration occurs for any reason, you are going to select no hemofiltration or dialysis required. And I know required makes it sound funny, but it's really that it either wasn't required or never administered. The patient never received it. So this is a change for us in the congenital database as well. Previously, we would have selected um, requiring dialysis at the time of discharge, but we will no longer do that. We will now say the patient never received it. So this is in the event of death. This is in the event that patient or family refuses dialysis treatment. Um, we will select no hemofiltration or dialysis required. Again, this is all spelled out in the training manual for you. Next slide. Okay, so let's move on now to unplanned interventional cardiovascular catheterization procedure. So the definition for this has also been updated. I've included some excerpts from the training manual here. We're really looking at that you underwent a catheter guided procedure in a blood vessel. So um, this is going to include some procedures that could occur in let's say a procedure suite, interventional radiology and or the cath lab. This also means that these procedures could be done then by an interventional radiologist, a cardiologist, um, or perhaps someone else who does procedures in a, in a procedure suite. So it's gonna be very important to note that it doesn't matter if it occurs in the cath lab or not. Um, again, we will include unplanned interventional EP procedures as in things like ablations, but we are not including pacemakers or ICD placements. All of this is again spelled out in the training manual. Next slide. So as we look here, if you were to select an unplanned interventional cath occurred, now we have new child fields and we're gonna pick what happened. So there's balloon dilation with and without stenting, there's placement of a stent, recalization of an occluded vessel, coiling of abnormal vessels. And then you see that there are two procedures that start with the word IR, drainage of fluid collection, and of course, um, lymphatic vessel occlusion. There's also then a selection of other, and then you can write in what it is if it's not something um, spelled out above. But the important part here is, this includes any catheter-based procedure regardless of the location or the interventionalist. So um, whether it, this procedure occurs in the cath lab or IR or by a radiologist or cardiologist or someone else, if one of these procedures is done, it doesn't matter by who, we're collecting that one of the procedures was done. So even though there are two fields that say IR, it doesn't matter if those were done in the cath lab, we're, we're capturing them. So very, very important to note as this is also a major um, complication. 
Um, also in the definitions, you're gonna see drainage of fluid collection is not meant to capture pleural or pericardial effusions. So this is actually one time in the database where the um, post-op events will not overlap. So if you went to the cath lab or you went to IR and you had did a drainage of a pericardial or pleural effusion, you will instead go and select the pleural and pericardial effusion post-op event rather than one of these. So if there is drainage of a fluid collection, perhaps it's an abscess or, or some other type of fluid collection that is, is being drained. Otherwise you won't select that field. Next slide. So let's go through a few examples. So patient goes to the cath lab for drainage of an abscess, you will select the interventional radiology drainage of fluid collection. So again, even though this was done in the cath lab and uh, most likely then by an interventional cardiologist, we're still ex selecting the post-op event of um, IR drainage of fluid collection. So next example is while in the cath lab for arch dilation, the radiologist enters and performs a thoracic duct, duct embolization. So now we're gonna select all the reasons that the patient um, underwent this unplanned interventional cardiac cath. So we'll say there was balloon dilation without stenting as well as IR lymphatic vessel occlusion. So again, we're selecting the procedures that were done. It doesn't matter where they were done. It's agnostic to the location as well as the provider or interventionalist performing the procedure. Next slide. So neurological deficit, I think this is one of the ones that gives me pause and I know we'll take um, you know, some extra work, perhaps even some extra training to, to understand, um, but bear with us. The definition has not changed. It's a newly recognized or newly acquired deficit of neurologic function. Um, so none of that has changed. However, how we're going to delineate these neurological deficits in the child fields is what will change. So initially, what you have to determine is, was there the presence of a neurological deficit? Then you go on to answer the child field. So no longer are we selecting the events of say stroke or subdural bleed and things. Um, you have to first identify a neurological deficit. And this is a better way to delineate the patient's post-operative course. Next slide. So once we've delineated that there was a neurological deficit sometime during the episode of care, we're now going to select the type of injury related to the neurological deficit. And so the type of injury could be a peripheral nerve, spinal cord injury, stroke, subdural bleed, an IVH greater than grade two, or perhaps even an unknown reason, but the patient does have a recognized neurological deficit. Next slide. So then you're going to indicate if the neurological deficit was present at time of discharge. This is going to be discharged from the episode of care because of course, neurological deficits are going to be followed for a major post-operative event timeframe. So this is through the episode of care. Next slide. If it was present at the time of discharge from the episode of care, you're now going to indicate which injuries are still present that were related um, to the neurological deficit. So peripheral nerve injury, spinal cord stroke, subdural bleed, IVH greater than grade two or other and unknown. So while it is the same list in the previous um, question, the first question is, was there a neuro deficit any time during the episode of care? This question is saying, if there was a neuro deficit that was present at discharge, tell us which of these injuries is related to that neurological deficit. Next slide. So a couple clarifications then in the training manual, you're not selecting any of these injury types in the absence of a neurological deficit. So in a program that perhaps is able to do serial neurologic um, imaging, so everybody gets a post-operative MRI or CT scan or, or something, that program is going to pick up a lot more findings, perhaps a bleed, perhaps um, a stroke or something along those lines that other programs who are not doing routine serial imaging are, are not gonna have the results of. So, so we don't wanna compare one program that is able to do serial imaging to another and, and their post-operative outcomes. The event in and of itself is, is not the outcome. It's the fact that you have a recognized neurological deficit. So just because there is a finding of a subdural bleed 
unless there is a neurological deficit, we're not selecting that subdural bleed. So this is a big change in the congenital database. And again, we are collecting through discharge from the episode of care. So the major post-operative event timeframe. Next slide. So let's go through a quick example since I think that this is you know, a pretty complex field and I understand that. So following their index operation, a patient experiences position-related foot drop and also experiences a hemorrhagic stroke resulting in a right upper extremity motor abnormality. At the time of discharge to home, the patient is walking normally, but continues to have severe weakness of the right upper extremity. Next slide. So is there a neurological deficit that occurred any time during the episode of care? And if you're following along on the data collection form, you'll see that this is sequence number 4740. Give you a few seconds. Yes, so we, as mentioned in the scenario above, there is foot drop related, um, position related, as well as the upper extremity motor abnormality. So I'm going to say yes to neurolo, or I'm gonna select neurological deficit in the post-op event list. Next slide. So what are the types of injury or injuries related to the neurological deficit? So this is the first trial field or sequence number 4801. Next slide. So as mentioned, there was a positional foot drop, which is going to be a peripheral nerve injury, as well as an upper extremity motor abnormality, and this was related to stroke. So you would select these two in the list of the type of injuries that are related to the neurological deficit. Next slide. Was there a neurological deficit present at the time of discharge from the episode of care? And again, this is sequence number 4802. Next slide. So yes, at the time of discharge, it was mentioned that um, the patient's walking normally, meaning the foot drop has resolved. However, there's continued upper extremity weakness at discharge to home, which ends this patient's episode of care. Next slide. What are the injuries related to the neurological deficit that are present at the time of discharge from the episode of care? So this is sequence number 4803. So this, this is asking exactly this, what injuries are, are related to that neurological deficit that we said um, was present at the time of discharge from the episode of care? Next slide. So it, we're gonna select stroke because the patient continues to have their upper extremity weakness or motor abnormality. Okay, Leslie. Okay, thanks, Jesse. That was awesome. So we're gonna go into reoperations a little bit here. You will notice that we are down to, instead of having three reoperation codes, we're down to just two. We have 22 unplanned cardiac reoperation and 26 non-cardiac reoperation. These are both major complications and both collected through the episode of care. And then they both have child fields for the reason for reoperation. But you'll notice 240 bleeding requiring reoperation is retired in version 6.23.2. So um, for unplanned cardiac reoperation, it's very similar to what it was before, an unplanned operation with the optype CPV or no CPV cardiovascular that occurs after the index operation or a reoperation for bleeding regardless of optype. So if you have a patient um, on ECMO or a VAD postoperatively, and has a reopt for bleeding, you will still select unplanned cardiac reoperation. And then for non-cardiac reoperation, this will be any additional non-cardiac operation after the index. Next slide. So first for unplanned cardiac reoperations, you will first select 22 unplanned cardiac reop, and then you will be given this list of child fields to select what happened to the patient. This is a select all that apply field. Next slide. A couple of clarifications. We know, as Chastity mentioned as well, and you'll hear this over and over again, there will be overlap with other complications. As a rule, stage repairs are planned, but planned means that there is a documented expectation to have a subsequent procedure prior to the index operation. So we know prior to them going in for that operation that we are going to do something else. Comments such as, will repair if the initial repair doesn't work, possibly, probably, may undergo, likely to undergo, do not qualify as making the operation planned. Next slide. 
For example, following the index operation, a patient returns to the ICU on ECMO and requires a bedside mediastinal exploration for suspected bleeding. Next slide. Was there an unplanned cardiac reoperation during the postoperative time period? Next slide. Yes, there was a mediastinal exploration for bleeding. Next slide. Which reoperation? <laughs> Which reoperation reason should be selected? Next slide. And you'll select reoperation for bleeding or suspected bleeding. Next slide. Okay, non cardiac reoperations. If a non cardiac reoperation occurs in the postoperative setting, select the reop reason. This is the same. First, you're going to select 26, and then you will have your child fields for what was, what was going on. Next slide. A couple of clarifications here. Again, there will be overlap with com other complications. This includes all non-cardiac reoperations through the episode of care, everything. No longer considers whether it's planned or unplanned. We will capture all reoperations, all non-cardiac reoperations. Next slide. So for example, following the index operation, a patient suffers respiratory failure requiring 15 postoperative vent days, fails their initial extubation, is reintubated, and undergoes a reoperation for trach. Next slide. Was there a non-cardiac reoperation during the postoperative time period? Next slide. Yes, the patient got a trach. Next slide. So you will open, you'll click 26, non-cardiac reop, and then you will see these child fields and you will then select trach. Next slide. Are there other post-operative events which should be captured? Next slide. Yes. You will also collect post-operative respiratory insufficiency requiring mechanical invasive in this case, vent support greater than seven days. If you haven't noticed, we did add invasive or non-invasive to this post-op event in the next version, 164 the requirement of reintubation, and of course, 170 for requiring the trach. Next slide. The same patient later requires a G-tube and prior to discharge, the parents request a circumcision. Next slide. Are there other post-operative events which should be captured? Next slide. Yes, you're going to select the feeding tube for the G-tube, select other, and then type in circumcision. Next slide. Okay, a separate patient. This patient is transferred to another center closer to home to continue their postoperative course. Through your follow-up, you learn that the patient was found to have a paralyzed diaphragm and underwent diaphragm plication on post-op day 45. Next slide. Are there any postoperative events that you should collect at your site? Next slide. Yes. You'll select 26 non-cardiac and then the diaphragm plication and also select paralyzed diaphragm. Um, those are both paralyzed diaphragm included major complications. Next slide. Okay, quick review. We're capturing all postoperative events through, sorry, this is for reoperations. Capturing all of these through the episode of care. There's no change to the definition of episode of care in version 6.23.2. So same thing, it's as Chastity reviewed, home or 30th postoperative day, whichever is longer discharge from acute care center, discharge from a chronic care center, unless they're at a chronic care center for 183 consecutive days without elevating their care. There is known overlap between complications. This is not overcoding. We know that it was done intentionally. And we will capture each postoperative event according to its own definition. So some will be new onset, some will just be this happened and so we collect it. And so it's very important to keep the training manual open. Do not rely on your previous knowledge of definitions or if there's definitions still in your software system, you need to have the training manual open and review the definitions for 6.23.2. Next slide. Okay, so just a few points in summary, the training manual will be posted online. There will be updated definitions. Please keep the training manual open as you're working. Individual questions with 6.23 will not be added to the training manual. You'll still get your individual responses, but we will only update the training manual with clarifications as needed. And then as always, Chastity and I and others are available 
whenever within reason you need. Yeah. Okay. I think that yeah. helps. Right. Great. Thank you, Chastity and Leslie. That was amazing as usual. Um, let's go ahead. I see we have several questions coming in. So let's um let's go ahead and tackle some questions. Um all right, let's see here. Our first question from Nancy. Um, good morning. Question on what form do we use if the patient has surgery June 30th, then July? How do we enter each version? So when you, when you, um, well, that's a good question because when you, the database, your software will know that your patient is greater than or less than 18. Um, mm -hmm. as well as your surgical date will tell you which version of the um, database that you'll use. So this is not any different than in previous updates. If you enter a surgery that occurs before July 1, the surgery date will open the 3.41 fields. And if you um, input a surgery with a surgery date after July 1, then you'll have the 6.2, 3.2 fields as long as your software version is updated at that time. Um, if you get updated later, let's say it's August 1st before your vendor updates your software, um, those patients with surgery dates of after July 1 um, will be updated and you'll have to go back in and then answer the 6.2, 3.2 questions. Yes, and in addition, if you're collecting on something for a June 30th case, you need to use June 30th, meaning 3.41 definitions. Mm -hmm. And then if you have another case that happens on July 3rd, it may, you know, look and appear like a similar field, but have a new definition. So pay very careful attention to which and when you're collecting. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> our next question from Don: why aren't we capturing an unplanned transvenous pacemaker placement post-op as an interventional cath procedure? Just wondering. That's a great question. When these started coming to the core group years ago, it was determined then that we would capture that as the need for post-op pacing in um, the arrhythmia section and not as an unplanned interventional cath procedure. Great, thanks, but, Jess. Okay, Leslie. I would say, Dr. Jacobs, did you want to weigh in any more? Any thought on that or? No, I was just going to support what you said. I think okay. you, you answered that right. The thought process behind it was that uh, an interventional cath is typically uh, a balloon angioplasty or a stent placement, something along those lines. Whereas we felt it was a little different if a transvenous pacemaker is placed. So we wanted to kind of keep that separate and coded exactly like you described. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. Thanks, Chastity. Um... All right. Uh, next question from Kathy. Does a diagnostic cath angiogram or IR angiograms catheter-based procedure count as an unplanned interventional path? No. Um, in your definition, that is true today as of what was true in 3.41 is that diagnostic caths or diagnostic angiograms are not unplanned interventional. The key word there being an intervention that was performed, not a diagnostic procedure. Perfect, thank you. Um, just to clarify, if a patient undergoes periocardiocentesis in the cath lab, we do not select unplanned interventional cath procedure, but rather pericardial effusion requiring drainage. Amy, great question. Correct. This is true in 3.41 and is the same in 6.2, 3.2. Perfect, thank you, Jess. Brooke. Um, will these unplanned cardiac reops be shown the same way in the harvest report or will bleeding be differentiated? Great question. Unknown at this time, I think. Right. We are working on um, how this uh, 6.23 data will be um, updated and, um, and reported on in the risk-adjusted dashboard. So that is a work in progress. So I have to discuss that with Dr. Subramanian. So still in discussions on how it's gonna be reported out. Uh, next question from Becky, where is the list of major versus minor events located? Just in the training manual or will these be annotated in the software? I don't think it was in no. any of the specs that went to vendors to be in software. So it would just be in right. uh, 
the training manual, it's the same, like the major, the things that go through episode of care, the same major complications we're used to capturing in that separate field. Um, but correct, it will only be described in the training manual. Correct, yeah. It was not included in the, the vendor software specifications. Um, and of course, our um, when will the training manual be posted? <laughs> the best question ever. Leslie and I, um, as you can tell, are actively working on it day and night, just getting some final clarifications. We do, we are awaiting some information from the task force meeting that will occur next week, I believe. Um, yep. No matter what, it'll be posted by July 1st. We're hoping to have it out a few days before. Yep. And thank you, Chastity and Leslie. You guys have put in an unreal amount of hours. Um, on this training manual. So um, thank you, everyone. It, it's just an, a, an absorbent amount of effort that's gone into it. So you guys are, are doing amazing. Um, our next question from Robin will, and I think Leslie, you had mentioned this, but will other facilities FAQs be posted on the site for all to see what others have asked and received a reply to? No, no, they will not. We will clarify add additions of when we can in the intent and clarifications to make things easier in the training manual. Another reason why it will be very important to keep that open and not rely on previous, you know, memories of the definitions. But I think we're treating this a little bit more like frequently asked questions rather than posting everything, mm -hmm. you know, getting to a thousand page document. Right. And that's that's currently how things, uh, you know, how we handle um, in the other training manuals as well as across other databases. Um, and especially with congenital, and I know we've talked about this before, a lot of the questions are so site specific. Um, that um, it's just, it causes, tends to cause more confusion when we post every single question out in the TM. So, um, so yeah, so um, we won't be posting every one moving forward. Um, okay, let's see here. Chess, Leslie, there's a question for Amy. I don't know if you guys could summarize that if you want me to read the whole thing. Um, for the I can't see the question anymore. Okay. Uh, for the Sorry. acute, oh no, that's okay. For the acute renal failure event, to clarify if dialysis or hemofiltration is used for fluid removal, electrolyte imbalance in a patient without, I can't say that word, ol oliguria. Oliguria, you got it. Yeah. Okay. Or elevated CR. Does the does this now need to be selected in acute renal failure since dialysis is now a standalone inclusion, or is this meant to capture acute renal failure as a complication and not the use of dialysis as a therapy? Okay, so you're re you have to select acute renal failure as an event before you talk about how the acute renal failure was treated. So if you do not meet the definition of acute renal failure, you won't select it, and then you will not select any of those child fields. They won't be available to you. So if you have not met the definition of acute renal failure, there is no way to delineate if somebody received any type of dialysis. Also, if you do meet the criteria for acute renal failure, if you're not actually dialyzing, that's not the intent of this either. So we're not looking at fluid removal methods or electrolyte imbalance. Um, we're really looking at that you're dialyzing the patient because they have acute renal failure. Okay. Thank you, Jess. Uh, just to verify, my computer will determine which version to use based on the date of the surgery. I'm a little behind on entering my surgeries and wanted to make sure. Correct. It is based on your surgical date. So one of the first questions you answer when you're entering a case into your database will be, what's the surgery date? And then um, it will, your vendor software will stamp the record as either a 3.41 or a 6.23.2. So even if you get updated and you're entering cases from today, um, you, you would still only be answering the 3.41 surgical fields. <clears throat> All right, next question from Kathy. This is not a version specific question. If a surgery is done with two surgeons, one congenital, one non-congenital, and there are two optos, cabbage and my myectomy, do we include the procedures done from the non-congenital surgeon? Yes, you will. Um, and this will be delineated in the new training manual, but you, and as it is currently stands today, that you are to enter all procedures done in the OR. Perfect. Thank you. Um, would next question from Maggie? Would the transvenous perm pacemaker procedure 
or the pericardial, pericardial drainage procedure also be captured as an unplanned cardiac operation? Yes and no. Um, the transvenous permanent pacemaker, if it were put in by a surgeon, then yes, it's an unplanned cardiac operation based on the op type. Um, but if it is put in in the cath lab, it is not an unplanned cardiac operation. The pericardial drainage procedure could potentially be an unplanned cardiac operation depending on the scenario. And we have put some examples in the training manual um, looking at pericardial drainage procedures versus unplanned cardiac operations. There, there may be overlap between those two post-operative events. Great, thanks. All right, next question um, from Jen is, if at all possible, and I'm sure you know, but if you're able to post a training manual next Monday or Tuesday, that would be ideal. We're working on training multiple people and need definitions. Yep, we are, Chastity and Leslie are working as hard as they can, so many hours, but unfortunately or fortunately, they, they must sleep. <laughs> um, so, but yes, Jen, it will be completed and posted as soon as possible. So um, just know they're working on it and we'll get it out there as soon as, as soon as we are able to. So, but they are working very hard. All right, um, I don't have any other questions just yet. So while we are waiting to see if any additional questions come in, just to cover um, upcoming webinars, just um, make sure you mark your calendars accordingly. Our next user group call will be July 11th. That was originally scheduled for, um, I think, July 4th. So we have pushed that back a week to July 11th at 12 p.m. Central. And then our next monthly webinar will be July 18th at 12 p.m. Um, PM Central. So mark your calendars. And as always, um, STS Marketing um, will send reminders for these upcoming webinars. My contact information is here. You all are very familiar with that. So if you need me, just reach out to me via email. I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Database operational questions, please reach out to stsdb at sts.org. If you have any questions about your current agreements, um, adding surgeons, anything like that, um, please reach out to STSDB operational. Um, if you have tech support related questions, questions about analysis reports or any other, any other anything else, please reach out to us at STSDB underscore help desk at STS.org. Um, that's all that I have for now. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Oh, here's another question. Um, all right, chast list. I'm related to version 6.23.2. If the only procedures a patient has done are ECMO related, should those be entered into the database or should I only enter those ECMO procedures that are done on a patient who has also had a CV surgery done? Um, Maggie, so you should be entering all procedures done by a um, pediatric congenital heart surgeon um, at your program into the database, regardless of whether they are an index operation or if the patient has had a, a previous index operation. Regardless so of if general <laughs> surgery did the ECMO procedure, you wouldn't put it in. But if your cardiac surgery surgeons did the ECMO procedure, then yes. Sorry, whoever I interrupted. Uh, that's right. That was right. Okay. All right. Great. Yep. You're welcome, Maggie. Um, all right. I am not seeing any additional questions. Is there anything else, Chastity, Leslie, that you guys wanted to cover or any thing for upcoming webinars you wanted to mention. Um, I know you guys are just working as hard as you can and right now to get that training manual out. And again, as Chastity and Leslie stated, we do have a task force um, meeting on Tuesday night. So there are some outstanding questions and clarifications that we need to get from the task force before we can publish this training manual. So once we get those questions answered from the task force, um, Chastity and Leslie will get um, get this um, training manual updated and get the information that they need, get things wrapped up, and um, we'll get it out as soon as we can. So, but again, we are dependent upon the task for some outstanding questions and definitions that are needed. Um, will the slides for today be posted later in the week? So yes, as soon as this webinar is over, I am going to PDF the slide deck and send it over to our marketing team. So they will um, curate the um, recording and get that posted as well as the slide deck that is um, the slide deck from today as well. Um, so, and they should have that posted by the end of the week, David. So hopefully, definitely no later by the, by the end of the week. So 
Um, have the audit notices gone out yet? No. So the audit notifications have not yet gone out. Those will be going out, I think, within the next one to two weeks. So um, I think I don't think any later than the next two weeks. Um, so those will be going out um, coming soon, but have not gone out just yet. And those audit notifications will be sent to the primary data and file contact as well as the service room representative for um, for the site. All right, you're welcome, David. Happy to help. All right, um, not seeing any additional questions come in. So um, we've got about 10 minutes left, but I wanted to thank Chastity and Leslie for an amazing presentation. Again, I appreciate everything you guys do. Um, couldn't do this without you, Dr. Meyer, Dr. Jacobs. Thank you guys. Thank you both for joining um, the webinar today. We appreciate um, you taking the time and joining. Um, and let's see who else is. So Melinda, thanks for staying on. I appreciate you. And if you guys have any other questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, I know this 6.23.2 version is very overwhelming. There's a lot of information. So again, all we can say is just please have that training, man training manual out with you at all times. Um, and Chastity, Leslie, myself, we're here to answer any questions that you have. So please, um, you know, utilize your resources and we're here to help in any way possible. So just remember, we're all in this together. We're all learning this together. So um, please be patient, be, be kind to yourself and be kind to others. And we will make it through this, I promise you. So um, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly. And with that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and um, we'll see you on our next call July 11th. Thanks, everyone. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week.